Chapter Sixty of Wives and Daughters. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell. Chapter Sixty. Roger Hamley's Confession. Roger had a great deal to think of as he turned away from looking after the carriage as long as it could be seen. The day before, he had believed that Molly had come to view all the symptoms of his growing love for her, symptoms which he thought had been so patent, as disgusting inconstancy to the inconstant Cynthia, that she had felt that an attachment which could be so soon transferred to another was not worth having, and that she had desired to mark all this by her changed treatment of him, and so to nip it in the bud. But this morning her old sweet frank manner had returned, in their last interview at any rate. He puzzled himself hard to find out what could have distressed her at breakfast-time. He even went so far as to ask Robinson whether Miss Gibson had received any letters that morning, and when he heard that she had had one, he tried to believe that the letter was in some way the cause of her sorrow. So far, so good. They were friends again after their unspoken difference, but that was not enough for Roger. He felt every day more and more certain that she and she alone could make him happy. He had felt this, and had partly given up all hope, while his father had been urging him upon the very course he most desired to take. No need for trying to love her, he said to himself, that was already done. And yet he was very jealous on her behalf. Was that love worthy of her which had once been given to Cynthia? Was not this affair too much a mocking mimicry of the last, again just on the point of leaving England for a considerable time, if he followed her now to her own home, in the very drawing-room where he had once offered to Cynthia? and then by a strong resolve he determined on this course. They were friends now, and he kissed the rose that was her pledge of friendship. If he went to Africa, he ran some deadly chances. He knew better what they were now than he had done when he went before. Until his return he would not even attempt to win more of her love than he already had. But once safe home again, no weak fancies as to what might or might not be her answer should prevent his running all chances to gain the woman who was to him the one who excelled all. His was not the poor vanity that thinks more of the possible mortification of a refusal than of the precious jewel of a bride that may be won. Somehow or another, please God to send him back safe, he would put his fate to the touch, and till then he would be patient. He was no longer a boy to rush at the coveted object. He was a man capable of judging and abiding. Molly sent her father, as soon as she could find him, to the hall, and then sat down to the old life in the home drawing-room, where she missed Cynthia's bright presence at every turn. Mrs. Gibson was in rather a querulous mood, which fastened itself upon the injury of Cynthia's letter being addressed to Molly and not to herself. "'Considering all the trouble I had with her trousseau, I think she might have written to me.' "'But she did. Her first letter was to you, mamma," said Molly, her real thoughts still intent upon the hall, upon the sick child, upon Roger, and his begging for the flower. "'Yes, just a first letter, three pages long, with an account of her crossing, while to you she can write about fashions, and how the bonnets are worn in Paris, and all sorts of interesting things. But poor mothers must never expect confidential letters. I have found that out.' "'You may see my letter, mamma," said Molly. "'There is really nothing in it. "'And to think of her writing and crossing to you who don't value it, "'while my poor heart is yearning after my lost child. "'Really, life is somewhat hard to bear at times.' "'Then there was silence, for a while. "'Do tell me something about your visit, Molly. "'Is Roger very broken-hearted? "'Does he talk much about Cynthia?' "'No, he does not mention her often.' hardly ever, I think. I never thought he had much feeling. If he had had, he would not have let her go so easily. I don't see how he could help it. When he came to see her after his return, she was already engaged to Mr. Henderson. He had come down that very day," said Molly, with perhaps more heat than the occasion required. "'My poor head,' said Mrs. Gibson, putting her hands up to her head. One may see you've been stopping with people of robust health, and excuse my saying it, Molly, of your friends, of unrefined habits. You've got to talk in so loud a voice. But do remember my head, Molly, 
So, Roger has quite forgotten Cynthia, has he? Oh, what inconstant creatures men are! He'll be falling in love with some grandee next, mark my words. They are making a pet and a line of him, and he's just the kind of weak young man to have his head turned by it all, and to propose to some fine lady of rank, who would no more think of marrying him than of marrying her footman." "'I don't think it is likely,' said Molly stoutly. "'Roger is too sensible for anything of the kind.' "'That's just the fault I always found with him, sensible and cold-hearted. Now that's a kind of character which may be very valuable, but which revolts me. Give me warmth of heart, even with a little of that extravagance of feeling which misleads the judgment, and conducts into romance. Poor Mr. Kirkpatrick! That was just his character. I used to tell him that his love for me was quite romantic. I think I have told you about his walking five miles in the rain to get me a muffin once when I was ill." Yes, said Molly. It was very kind of him. So imprudent, too! Just what one of your sensible, cold-hearted, commonplace people would never have thought of doing, with his cough and all." "'I hope he didn't suffer for it,' replied Molly, anxious at any cost to keep off the subject of the Hamleys, upon which she and her stepmother always disagreed, and on which she found it difficult to keep her temper. "'Yes, indeed, he did. I don't think he ever got over the cold he called that day. I wish you had known him, Molly. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if you had been my real daughter, and Cynthia dear papa's, and Mr. Kirkpatrick and your own dear mother had all lived. People talk a great deal about natural affinities. It would have been a question for a philosopher." She began to think on the impossibilities she had suggested. "'I wonder how the poor little boy is,' said Molly, after a pause, speaking out her thought. "'Poor little child! When one thinks how little his prolonged existence is to be desired, one feels that his death would be a boon." "'Mamma! What do you mean?' asked Molly, much shocked. "'Why, every one cares for his life as the most precious thing. You have never seen him. He is the bonniest, sweetest little fellow that ever can be. What do you mean?' I should have thought that the squire would have desired a better-born heir than the offspring of a servant, with all his ideas about descent and blood and family, and I should have thought that it was a little mortifying to Roger, who must naturally have looked upon himself as his brother's heir, to find a little interloping child, half French, half English, stepping into his shoes. You don't know how fond they are of him. The squire looks upon him as the apple of his eye. "'Molly, Molly, pray don't let me hear you using such vulgar expressions. When shall I teach you true refinement, that refinement which consists in never even thinking of vulgar, commonplace thing? Proverbs and idioms are never used by people of education. Apple of his eye! I really am shocked.' "'Well, Mamma, I'm very sorry, but after all, what I wanted to say as strongly as I could was, that the squire loves the little boy as much as his own child and that Roger—oh, what a shame to think that Roger—" And she stopped suddenly short, as if she were choked. "'I don't wonder at your indignation, my dear,' said Mrs. Gibson. "'It is just what I should have felt at your age. But one learns the baseness of human nature with advancing years. I was wrong, though, to undeceive you so early. But depend upon it, the thought I alluded to has crossed Roger Hamley's mind. All sorts of thoughts cross one's mind. It depends upon whether one gives them harbour and encouragement," said Molly. "'My dear, if you must have the last word, don't let it be a truism. But let us talk on some more interesting subject. I asked Cynthia to buy me a silk gown in Paris, and I said I would send her word what colour I fixed upon. I think dark blue is the most becoming to my complexion. What do you say?" Molly agreed, sooner than take the trouble of thinking about the thing at all. She was far too full of her silent review of all the traits in Roger's character which had lately come under her notice, and that gave the lie direct to her stepmother's supposition. Just then they heard Mr. Gibson's step downstairs. But it was some time before he made his entrance into the room where they were sitting. "'How is little Roger?' asked Molly eagerly. "'Beginning with scarlet fever, I'm afraid. It's well you left when you did, Molly. You've never had it. We must stop all intercourse with the hall for a time. If there's one illness I dread, it is this." "'But you go and come back to us, papa?' "'Yes, but I always take plenty of precautions. 
However, no need to talk about risks that lie in the way of one's duty. It is unnecessary risks that we must avoid." "'Will he have it badly?' asked Molly. "'I can't tell. I shall do my best for the wee laddie." Whenever Mr. Gibson's feelings were touched, he was apt to recur to the language of his youth. Molly knew now that he was much interested in the case. For some days there was imminent danger to the little boy. For some weeks there was a more chronic form of illness to contend with, but when the immediate danger was over and the warm daily interest was past, Molly began to realize that, from the strict quarantine her father evidently thought it necessary to establish between the two houses, she was not likely to see Roger again before his departure for Africa. Oh, if she had but made more of the uncared-for days that she had passed with him at the hall! Worse than uncared for! Days on which she had avoided him, refused to converse freely with him, given him pain by her change of manner, for she had read in his eyes, heard in his voice that he had been perplexed and pained, and now her imagination dwelt on and exaggerated the expression of his tones and looks. One evening after dinner her father said, "'As the country people say, I've done a stroke of work to-day. Roger Hamley and I have laid our heads together, and we made a plan by which Mrs. Osborne and her boy will leave the hall.' "'What did I say the other day, Molly?' said Mrs. Gibson, interrupting, and giving Molly a look of extreme intelligence. "'And go into lodgings at Jennings Farm, not four hundred yards from the Parkfield Gate,' continued Mr. Gibson. The squire and his daughter-in-law have got to be much better friends over the little fellow's sick-bed, and I think he sees now how impossible it would be for the mother to leave her child, and go and be happy in France, which has been the whole notion running in his head all the time, to buy her off, in fact. But that one night, when I was very uncertain whether I could bring him through, they took to crying together, and condoling with each other, and it was just like tearing down a curtain that had been between them. They have been rather friends than otherwise ever since. Still, Roger—" Molly's cheeks grew warm, and her eyes grew soft and bright. It was such a pleasure to hear his name. "'And I both agree that his mother knows much better how to manage the boy than his grandfather does. I suppose that was the one good thing she got from that hard-hearted mistress of hers. She certainly has been well trained in the management of children. And it makes her impatient and annoyed and unhappy when she sees the squire giving the child nuts and ale, and all sorts of silly indulgences, and spoiling him in every possible way. Yet she's a coward, and doesn't speak out her mind. Now, by being in lodgings, and having her own servants—nice pretty rooms they are, too. We went to see them, and Mrs. Jennings promises to attend well to Mrs. Osborne Hamley, and is very much honoured, and all that sort of thing not ten minutes' walk from the hall, so that she and the little chap may easily go backwards and forwards as often as they like, and yet she may keep control over the child's discipline and diet. In short, I think I've done a good day's work," he continued, stretching himself out a little, and then with a shake rousing himself, and making ready to go out again, to see a patient who had sent for him in his absence. "'A good day's work,' he repeated to himself as he ran downstairs. I don't know when I have been so happy." For he had not told Molly all that had passed between him and Roger. Roger had begun a fresh subject of conversation, just as Mr. Gibson was hastening away from the hall, after completing the new arrangement for Emma and her child. "'You know that I set off next Tuesday, Mr. Gibson, don't you?' said Roger, a little abruptly. "'To be sure. I hope you'll be as successful in all your scientific objects as you were the last time, and have no sorrows awaiting you when you come back." "'Thank you. Yes, I hope so. You don't think there's any danger of infection now, do you?' "'No. If the disease were to spread through the household, I think we should have had some signs of it before now. One is never sure, remember, with scarlet fever.' Roger was silent for a minute or two. "'Should you be afraid?' he said at length of seeing me at your house. Thank you, but I think I would rather decline the pleasure of your society there at present. It's only three weeks or a month since the child began. Besides, I shall be over here again before you go. I'm always on my guard against symptoms of dropsy. I have known it supervene." "'Then I shall not see Molly again,' said Roger, in a tone and with a look of great disappointment. Mr. Gibson turned his keen, observant eyes upon the young man and looked at him in as penetrating a manner as if he had been beginning with an unknown illness. Then the doctor and the father compressed his lips, and gave vent to a long, intelligent whistle. "'Phew!' 
said he. Roger's bronzed cheeks took a deeper shade. "'You will take a message to her from me, won't you? A message of farewell?' he pleaded. "'Not I. I am not going to be a message-carrier between any young man and young woman. I'll tell my womenkind I forbade you to come near the house, and that you're sorry to go away without bidding good-bye. That's all I shall say. But you do not disapprove. I see you guess why. Oh, Mr. Gibson, just speak to me one word of what must be in your heart, though you are pretending not to understand why I would give worlds to see Molly again before I go." "'My dear boy,' said Mr. Gibson, more affected than he liked to show, and laying his hand on Roger's shoulder. Then he pulled himself up and said gravely enough, "'Mind, Molly is not Cynthia. If she were to care for you, she is not one who could transfer her love to the next comer." "'You mean not as readily as I have done,' replied Roger. "'I only wish you could know what a different feeling this is to my boyish love for Cynthia.' "'I wasn't thinking of you when I spoke. But, however, as I might have remembered afterwards that you were not a model of constancy, let us hear what you have to say for yourself.' "'Not much. I did love Cynthia very much. Her manners and her beauty bewitched me. But her letters—short, hurried letters, sometimes showing that she hadn't really taken the trouble to read mine through—I cannot tell you the pain they gave me. Twelve months' solitude in frequent danger of one's life, face to face with death, sometimes ages a man like many years' experience. Still I longed for the time when I should see her sweet face again, and hear her speak. Then the letter at the Cape. And still I hoped. But you know how I found her when I went to have the interview which I trusted might end in the renewal of our relations. Engaged to Mr. Henderson. I saw her walking with him in your garden, coquetting with him about a flower, just as she used to do with me. I can see the pitying look in Molly's eyes as she watched me. I can see it now. And I could beat myself for being such a blind fool as to— What must she think of me? How she must despise me, choosing the false duessa. Come, come, Cynthia isn't so bad as that. She's a very fascinating, faulty creature. I know, I know. I will never allow any one to say a word against her. If I called her the false duessa it was because I wanted to express my sense of the difference between her and Molly as strongly as I could. You must allow for a lover's exaggeration. Besides, all I wanted to say was, do you think that Molly, after seeing and knowing that I had loved a person so inferior to herself, could ever be brought to listen to me?" "'I don't know. I can't tell. And even if I could, I wouldn't. Only if it's any comfort to you, I may say what my experience has taught me. Women are queer, unreasoning creatures, and are just as likely as not to love a man who has been throwing away his affection." "'Thank you, sir,' said Roger, interrupting him. I see you mean to give me encouragement. And I had resolved never to give Molly a hint of what I felt until I returned, and then to try and win her by every means in my power. I determined not to repeat the former scene in the former place, in your drawing-room, however I might be tempted. And perhaps, after all, she avoided me when she was here last. No, Roger, I've listened to you long enough. If you've nothing better to do with your time than to talk about my daughter, I have. When you come back it'll be time enough to inquire how far your father would approve of such an engagement. He himself urged it the other day, but then I was in despair. I thought it was too late. And what means are you likely to have of maintaining a wife? I always thought that point was passed too lightly over when you formed your hurried engagement to Cynthia. I'm not mercenary. Molly has some money independently of me. And she, by the way, knows nothing of. Not much, and I can allow her something. But all these things must be left till your return." "'Then you sanction my attachment?' "'I don't know what you mean by sanctioning it. I can't help it. I suppose losing one's daughter is a necessary evil. Still,' seeing the disappointed expression on Roger's face, "'it is but fair to say to you, I'd rather give my child, my only child, remember, to you than to any man in the world.' "'Thank you,' said Roger shaking hands with Mr. Gibson almost against the will of the latter. "'And I may see her just once before I go?' "'Decidedly not. There I come in as a doctor as well as a father. 
No. But you will take a message at any rate. To my wife and to her conjointly, I will not separate them. I will not in the slightest way be a go-between. Very well, said Roger. Tell them both, as strongly as you can, how I regret your prohibition. I see I must submit. But if I don't come back, I'll haunt you for having been so cruel. Come, I like that. Give me a wise man of science and love. No one beats him in folly. Good-bye. Good-bye. You will see Molly this afternoon. To be sure, and you will see your father. But I don't heave such portentous sighs at the thought." Mr. Gibson gave Roger's message to his wife and to Molly that evening at dinner. It was but what the latter had expected, after all her father had said of the very great danger of infection. But now that her expectation came in the shape of a final decision, it took away her appetite. She submitted in silence, but her observant father noticed that after this speech of his she only played with the food on her plate, and concealed a good deal of it under her knife and fork. "'Lover versus father,' thought he, half sadly. "'Lover wins.' And he, too, became indifferent to all that remained of his dinner. Mrs. Gibson pattered on, and nobody listened. The day of Roger's departure came. Molly tried hard to forget it in working away at a cushion she was preparing as a present to Cynthia. People did worsted work in those days. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All wrong. She was thinking of something else, and had to unpick it. It was a rainy day, too, and Mrs. Gibson, who had planned to go out and pay some calls, had to stay indoors. This made her restless and fidgety. She kept going backwards and forwards to different windows in the drawing-room to look at the weather, as if she imagined that while it rained at one window it might be fine weather at another. "'Molly, come here! Who is that man wrapped up in a cloak there, near the park wall, under the beech-tree? He has been there this half-hour and more, never stirring, and looking at the house all the time. I think it's very suspicious." Molly looked, and in an instant recognised Roger under all his wraps. Her first instinct was to draw back. The next to come forwards and say, "'Why, Mamma, it's Roger Hamley. Look now, he's kissing his hand. He's wishing us good-bye in the only way he can." and she responded to this sign, but she was not sure if he perceived her modest, quiet movement, for Mrs. Gibson became immediately so demonstrative that Molly fancied that her eager, foolish, pantomimic motions must absorb all his attention. "'I call this so attentive of him,' said Mrs. Gibson, in the midst of a volley of kisses of her hand. "'Really, it is quite romantic. It reminds me of former days. But he will be too late. I must send him away. It is half-past twelve and she took out her watch and held it up, tapping it with her forefinger, and occupying the very centre of the window. Molly could only peep here and there, dodging now up, now down, and now on this side, now on that, of the perpetually moving arms. She fancied she saw something of a corresponding movement on Roger's part. At length he went away slowly, slowly, and often looking back in spite of the tapped watch. Mrs. Gibson at last retreated, and Molly quietly moved into her place to see his figure once more before the turn of the road hid it from her view. He, too, knew where the last glimpse of Mr. Gibson's house was to be obtained, and once more he turned, and his white handkerchief floated in the air. Molly waved hers high up, with eager longing that it should be seen. And then he was gone, and Molly returned to her worsted work, happy, glowing, sad, content, and thinking to herself how sweet is friendship. When she came to a sense of the present, Mrs. Gibson was saying, "'Upon my word, though Roger Hamley has never been a great favourite of mine, this little attention of his has reminded me very forcibly of a very charming young man, a superant, as the French would call him, Lieutenant Harper. You must have heard me speak of him, Molly.' "'I think I have,' said Molly absently. "'Well, you remember how devoted he was to me when I was at Mrs. Duncombe's, my first situation and I only seventeen. And when the recruiting party was ordered to another town, poor Mr. Harper came and stood opposite the schoolroom window for nearly an hour, and I know it was his doing that the band played, the girl I left behind me, when they marched out the next day. Oh, poor Mr. Harper! It is before I knew dear Mr. Kirkpatrick. Dear me! How often my poor heart has had to bleed in this life of mine! 
not but what dear papa is a very worthy man, and makes me very happy. He would spoil me, indeed, if I would let him. Still, he is not as rich as Mr. Henderson." That last sentence contained the germ of Mrs. Gibson's present grievance. Having married Cynthia, as her mother put it, taking credit to herself as if she had had the principal part in the achievement, she now became a little envious of her daughter's good fortune in being the wife of a young, handsome, rich, and moderately fashionable man who lived in London. She naively expressed her feelings on this subject to her husband one day, when she was really not feeling quite well, and when, consequently, her annoyances were much more present to her mind than her sources of happiness. "'It is such a pity,' said she, "'that I was born when I was. I should so have liked to belong to this generation.' "'That's sometimes my own feeling,' said he. "'So many new views seem to be opened in science, that I should like, if it were possible, to live till their reality was ascertained, and one saw what they led to. But I don't suppose that's your reason, my dear, for wishing to be twenty or thirty years younger.' "'No, indeed, and I did not put it in that hard, unpleasant way. I only said I should like to belong to this generation. To tell the truth, I was thinking of Cynthia. Without vanity, I believe I was as pretty as she is, when I was a girl, I mean. I had not her dark eyelashes, but then my nose was straighter. And now look at the difference. I have to live in a little country town with three servants and no carriage, and she, with her inferior good looks, will live in Sussex Place, and keep a man and a broom, and I don't know what. But the fact is, in this generation there are so many more rich young men than there were when I was a girl." Oh ho! So that's your reason, is it, my dear? If you had been young now, you might have married somebody as well off as Walter." "'Yes,' said she. "'I think that was my idea. Of course, I should have liked him to be you. I always think if you had gone to the bar you might have succeeded better, and lived in London, too. I don't think Cynthia cares much where she lives, yet you see it has come to her." "'What has? London?' "'Oh, you dear, facetious man! Now that's just the thing to have captivated a jury. I don't believe Walter will ever be so clever as you are. Yet he can take Cynthia to Paris, and abroad, and everywhere. I only hope all this indulgence won't develop the faults in Cynthia's character. It's a week since we heard from her, and I did write so particularly to ask her for the autumn fashions before I bought my new bonnet. But riches are a great snare." "'Be thankful you are spared temptation, my dear.' "'No, I'm not. Everybody likes to be tempted and after all it's very easy to resist temptation if one wishes." "'I don't find it so easy,' said her husband. "'Here's medicine for you, mamma," said Molly, entering with a letter held up in her hand. "'A letter from Cynthia.' "'Oh, you dear little messenger of good news! There was one of the heathen deities in Mangle's questions whose office it was to bring news. The letter is dated from Calais. They're coming home! She's bought me a shawl and a bonnet, the dear creature! Always thinking of others before herself, good fortune cannot spoil her. They've a fortnight left of their holiday. Their house is not quite ready, they're coming here. Oh, now, Mr. Gibson, we must have the new dinner service at Watts's I've set my heart on so long. Home, Cynthia calls this house. I'm sure it has been a home to her, poor darling. I doubt if there is another man in the world who would have treated his stepdaughter like a dear papa. And, Molly, you must have a new gown." "'Come, come, remember I belong to the last generation,' said Mr. Gibson. "'And Cynthia will not notice what I wear,' said Molly, bright with pleasure at the thought of seeing her again. "'No, but Walter will. He has such a quick eye for dress, and I think I rival papa. If he's a good stepfather, I'm a good stepmother, and I could not bear to see my Molly shabby, and not looking her best. I must have a new gown, too. It won't do to look as if we had nothing but the dresses which we wore at the wedding." But Molly stood out against the new gown for herself, and urged that if Cynthia and Walter were to come to visit them often, they had better see them as they really were, in dress, habits, and appointments. When Mr. Gibson had left the room, Mrs. Gibson softly reproached Molly for her obstinacy. "'You might have allowed me to beg for a new gown for you, Molly, when you knew how much I had admired that figured silk at Brown's the other day. And now, of course, I can't be so selfish as to get it for myself, and you to have nothing. You should learn to understand the wishes of other people. Still, on the whole, you are a dear, sweet girl, and I only wish—well, I know what I wish, only dear papa does not like it to be talked about. And now, cover me up close and let me go to sleep, 
and dream about my dear Cynthia and my new shawl. Concluding Remarks by the Editor of the Cornhill Magazine Here the story is broken off, and it can never be finished. What promised to be the crowning work of a life is a memorial of death. A few days longer, and it would have been a triumphal column, crowned with a capital of festal leaves and flowers. Now it is another sort of column, one of those sad white pillars which stand broken in the churchyard. But if the work is not quite complete, little remains to be added to it, and that little has been distinctly reflected into our minds. We know that Roger Hamley will marry Molly, and that is what we are most concerned about. Indeed, there was little else to tell. Had the writer lived, she would have sent her hero back to Africa forthwith, and those scientific parts of Africa are a long way from Hamley, and there is not much to choose between a long distance and a long time. How many hours are there in twenty-four when you are all alone in a desert place, a thousand miles from the happiness which might be yours to take, if you were there to take it? How many, when from the sources of the Topinambo your heart flies back ten times a day, like a carrier pigeon, to the one only source of future good for you, and ten times a day returns with its message undelivered? Many more than are counted on the calendar. So Roger found. The days were weeks that separated him from the time when Molly gave him a certain little flower, and months from the time which divorced him from Cynthia, whom he had begun to doubt before he knew for certain that she was never much worth hoping for. And if such were his days, what was the slow procession of actual weeks and months in those remote and solitary places? They were like years of a stay-at-home life, with liberty and leisure to see that nobody was courting Molly meanwhile. The effect of this was, that long before the term of his engagement was ended, all that Cynthia had been to him was departed from Roger's mind, and all that Molly was and might be to him filled it full. He returned, but when he saw Molly again he remembered that to her the time of his absence might not have seemed so long, and was oppressed with the old dread that she would think him fickle. Therefore this young gentleman, so self-reliant and so lucid in scientific matters, found it difficult, after all, to tell Molly how much he hoped she loved him, and might have blundered if he had not thought of beginning by showing her the flower that was plucked from the nosegay. How charmingly that scene would have been drawn, had Mrs. Gaskell lived to depict it, we can only imagine. That it would have been charming, especially in what Molly did and looked and said, we know. Roger and Molly are married, and if one of them is happier than the other it is Molly, her husband has no need to draw upon the little fortune which is to go to poor Osborne's boy, for he becomes professor at some great scientific institution, and wins his way in the world handsomely. The squire is almost as happy in this marriage as his son. If any one suffers for it, it is Mr. Gibson. But he takes a partner, so as to get a chance of running up to London to stay with Molly for a few days now and then, and to get a little rest from Mrs. Gibson. Of what was to happen to Cynthia after her marriage the author was not heard to say much, and indeed it does not seem that anything needs to be added. One little anecdote, however, was told of her by Mrs. Gaskell, which is very characteristic. One day, when Cynthia and her husband were on a visit to Hollingford, Mr. Henderson learned for the first time, through an innocent casual remark of Mr. Gibson's, that the famous traveller Roger Hamley was known to the family. Cynthia had never happened to mention it. How well that little incident, too, would have been described! But it is useless to speculate upon what would have been done by the delicate, strong hand which can create no more Molly Gibsons, no more Roger Hamleys. We have repeated in this brief note all that is known of her designs for the story, which would have been completed in another chapter. There is not so much to regret, then, so far as this novel is concerned. Indeed, the regrets of those who knew her are less for the loss of the novelist than of the woman one of the kindest and wisest of her time. But yet, for her own sake as a novelist alone, her untimely death is a matter of deep regret. It is clear in this novel of wives and daughters, in the exquisite little story that preceded it, Cousin Phyllis, and in Sylvia's lovers, that Mrs. Gaskell had within these five years started upon a new career with all the freshness of youth, and with a mind which seemed to have put off its clay and to have been born again but that put off its clay must be taken in a very narrow sense. All minds are tinctured more or less with the muddy vesture in which they are contained, but few minds ever showed less of base earth than Mrs. Gaskell's. 
it was so at all times, but lately even the original slight tincture seemed to disappear. While you read any one of the last three books we have named, you feel yourself caught out of an abominable wicked world, crawling with selfishness and reeking with base passions, into one where there is much weakness, many mistakes, sufferings long and bitter, but where it is possible for people to live calm and wholesome lives. And what is more, you feel that this is at least as real a world as the other. The kindly spirit which thinks no ill looks out of her pages irradiate, and while we read them, we breathe the pure intelligence which prefers to deal with emotions and passions which have a living root in minds within the pale of salvation, and not with those which wrought without it. This spirit is more especially declared in Cousin Phyllis and Wives and Daughters, their author's last works. They seem to show that for her the end of life was not descent amongst the clods of the valley, but ascent into the pure air of the heaven-aspiring hills. We are saying nothing now of the merely intellectual qualities displayed in these later works. Twenty years to come, that may be thought the more important question of the two. In the presence of her grave we cannot think so. But it is true all the same that as mere works of art and observation, these later novels of Mrs. Gaskell's are among the finest of our time. There is a scene in Cousin Phyllis, where Holman, making hay with his men, ends the day with a psalm, which is not excelled as a picture in all modern fiction, and the same may be said of that chapter of this last story, in which Roger smokes a pipe with the squire after the quarrel with Osborne. There is little in either of these scenes, or in a score of others which succeed each other like gems in a cabinet, which the ordinary novel-maker could seize. There is no material for him in half a dozen farming men singing hymns in a field, or a discontented old gentleman smoking tobacco with his son. Still less could he avail himself of the miseries of a little girl sent to be happy in a fine house full of fine people, but it is just in such things as these that true genius appears brightest and most unapproachable. It is the same with the personages in Mrs. Gaskell's works. Cynthia is one of the most difficult characters which has ever been attempted in our time. Perfect art always obscures the difficulties it overcomes, and it is not till we try to follow the processes by which such a character as the Tito of Romola is created, for instance, that we begin to understand what a marvellous piece of work it is. To be sure, Cynthia was not so difficult, nor is it nearly so great a creation as that splendid achievement of art and thought, of the rarest art, of the profoundest thought. But she also belongs to the kind of characters which are conceived only in minds large, clear, harmonious, and just, and which can be portrayed fully and without flaw only by hands obedient to the finest motions of the mind. Viewed in this light, Cynthia is a more important piece of work than even Molly, delicately as she is drawn, and true and harmonious as that picture is also. And what we have said of Cynthia may be said with equal truth of Osborne Hamley. The true delineation of a character like that is as fine a test of art as the painting of a foot or a hand, which also seems so easy, and in which perfection is most rare. In this case the work is perfect. Mrs. Gaskell has drawn a dozen characters more striking than Osborne since she wrote Mary Barton, but not one which shows more exquisite finish. Another thing we may be permitted to notice, because it has a great and general significance. It may be true that this is not exactly the place for criticism, but since we are writing of Osborne Hamley, we cannot resist pointing out a peculiar instance of the subtler conceptions which underlie all really considerable works. Here are Osborne and Roger, two men who, in every particular that can be seized for description, are totally different creatures. Body and mind they are quite unlike. They have quite different tastes, they take different ways, they are men of two sorts, which, in the society sense, never know each other. And yet never did brotherly blood run more manifest than in the veins of those two. To make that manifest without allowing the effort to peep out for a single moment would be a triumph of art. But it is a touch beyond the reach of art to make their likeness and unlikeness so natural a thing that we no more wonder about it than we wonder at seeing the fruit and the bloom on the same bramble. We have always seen them there together in blackberry season, and do not wonder about it nor think about it at all. Inferior writers, even some writers who are highly accounted, would have revelled in the contrast, persuaded that they were doing a fine anatomical dramatic thing by bringing it out at every opportunity. To the author of Wives and Daughters this sort of anatomy was mere dislocation. 
She began by having the people of her story born in the usual way, and not built up like the Frankenstein monster. And thus when Squire Hamley took a wife, it was then provided that his two boys should be as naturally one and diverse as the fruit and the bloom on the bramble. It goes without speaking. These differences are precisely what might have been expected from the union of Squire Hamley with the town-bred, refined, delicate-minded woman whom he married, and the affection of the young men, their kindness, to use the word in its old and new meanings at once, is nothing but a reproduction of those impalpable threads of love which bound the equally diverse father and mother in bonds faster than the ties of blood. But we will not permit ourselves to write any more in this vein. It is unnecessary to demonstrate to those who know what is and what is not true literature, that Mrs. Gaskell was gifted with some of the choicest faculties bestowed upon mankind, that these grew into greater strength and ripened into greater beauty in the decline of her days, and that she has gifted us with some of the truest, purest works of fiction in the language. And she was herself what her works show her to have been, a wise, good woman. End of chapter 60 End of Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell